All right. I do not believe. Are you guys in here? If you're in here, go ahead and type something into the chat bar uh, so that I know you guys are here. So uh, if there's a teacher in the room, go ahead and type something into the chat bar so I know you guys are ready to go. It looks like we now are in. Guys, go ahead and type something in the chat bar so I know you're here. You can't type, type something in because you guys are um, away. That is fine. Yeah, I just thought about that. If you guys are online at school you may not be able to type something in because you have to be signed in to make a comment and that is okay uh, that is fine and we will work that out as we move forward but it appears that we are here so what i'm going to do is while this is going i'm going to record it as well just in case you're not and this way we can knock it out okay here we go good morning everybody and welcome i am uh, away from you guys currently um not at school but that's okay because we're gonna make sure that we get this thing going correctly all right i know i'm, I'm out right now i'm out because i precautionary issue got a little sick want to make sure i don't have covid um to keep you guys safe so i'm, I'm away getting tested for that but while i'm away i'm gonna still teach you guys from here now uh, yesterday I had you write down these vocab words. I'm going to go back over them with you guys real quickly for our do now, and then we'll get into our lesson for the day. So juvenile rights are rights of the people under the age of 18. So you guys are under the age of 18, so you have juvenile rights. Executive privilege is the belief that the conversations between the presidents and his aides are confidential. So there's something called uh, top secret material. The conversations between the president and his aides are our top secret material landmark landmarks are an important or unique decision event fact or discovery so in a landmark uh, when we talk about landmark cases I want you guys to think about landmarks out in the world right so things like um, mountains right that would be a landmark or a swamp is a landmark think about the geographical features we went over things that typically stand out those are landmarks those are things that you can see from a distance so if we talk about jacksonville we may talk about everbank field right it's a big field you can see it from a long ways away all right it's a big football stadium right it's a landmark it's something that people know about they can see they can get to uh, we talk about prosecute that's to carry out a legal action against an accused person to prove his or her guilt and then finally, judicial review is the power of the U.S. courts to examine laws or actions of the legislative and executive branches of the government and to determine whether such actions are consistent with the U.S. Constitution. Okay, that brings us to two more that you need to have down, and that's constitutional and unconstitutional. Constitutional and unconstitutional. So make sure you write those two words down, constitutional and unconstitutional, and constitutional is something that goes with the Constitution. It's legal through the Constitution. Unconstitutional would be the opposite of that. It goes against the Constitution. All right. So I've given you guys a few minutes to look these over. Hopefully you have these written down already. If you don't, you can always go to the updates page on Schoology and you can check them out there. So let's get into it. Oh, where's my... I lost my page. Hey guys, today is Mr. Cantaloupe Monday. I know it's not Monday, but it's Tuesday. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into it. Our agenda today is we currently have our do now. We've got to go through with that. Um, and welcome agenda and expectations are currently going on. And then we'll get to our essential questions, standards, and objectives. That's going to take us roughly three minutes. Then I'm going to lecture you on 
the uh, landmark Supreme Court cases should take 25 minutes. You'll have a chance to work on your homework, and then we'll see if you guys win Beat the Teacher. So, again, your Beat the Teacher today will be carried out by your sub. They're going to determine whether or not you guys win Beat the Teacher. So, if we're talking not paying attention, if we're not doing the right things, and I know all of you know what the right things for my classroom are, then you guys will not win Beat the Teacher. Today's Beat the Teacher, well, you guys will get to play um, – Spider-Man, and I'll let, pick somebody in the class that will run it for me. Okay. My expectations are we're going to have a great class. We're going to learn something new. We're going to have fun. We're going to follow champs, and we're going to win, be the teacher. Today, for our champs, uh, guys, your conversation, you're going to be at level zero because you're going to be taking notes. If, you're gonna, if you need help, what I want you to do is write down your question, and I'm going to have you type them in. Uh, at the end of class. Uh, our activity today is you guys are going to be taking notes and listening to a lecture. Your movement will be stationary. Your participation, you are working individually as a whole group discussion, and this will lead us to success. So I hope you had su said success in the classroom with me. Um, I can hear you guys saying it in my mind. It sounds great, and I know you guys are going to follow champs today and pay attention. Our standard from today was SS7.C.3.12, which says we're going to analyze the significance and outcomes of landmark Supreme Court cases, including but not limited to Mulberry v. Madison, Pelzey v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, Gideon v. Rainwhite, Miranda v. Arizona, Regalt, Tinker v. Des Moines, Hazelwood v. Kilmer, United States v. Nixon, and Bush v. Gore. My essential question is, what is the significance of the following landmark Supreme Court cases? Mulberry v. Madison, Pleasy v. Ferguson, Board v. Board of Education, Gideon v. Wainwright, Miranda v. Arizona, Regalt, Tinker v. Des Moines, Hazelwood v. Colmer, United States v. Nixon, and Bush v. Gore. Our objective today is we will learn about the impact of the landmark Supreme Court cases. Okay, so now you're going to need two things to follow along. You should have already received a guided notes from your teacher for the day. Um, I don't know if you guys got that yet or not. If you haven't, that's fine. You can follow along on Schoology. Uh, let me bring that up. So it should look like this. Here's my guided notes from Schoology. Uh, hopefully you have this in paper form. If you don't, that's fine. You're going to fill it in on notebook paper as we go along. So make sure you have that up and ready to go because we are going to be using it. Okay. So let us do that now. Here we go. There have been several landmark or important and unique U.S. Supreme Court cases that have had a huge impact on American society and government. The judicial opinions or the judgment by the courts have changed the way the government can operate and they've helped protect our freedoms. So what does landmark mean? A landmark is an important or unique U.S. Supreme Court case that's had a huge impact on American society and government. Judicial opinions are the judgments by the court that have changed the way the government can operate and they have helped protect our freedoms. Okay, So judicial opinion is the judgment made by the court. It's the decision they make. So when the judge reads their verdict, that's a judicial opinion. It's what they write following a landmark Supreme Court case. And you can go back and read them. Um, they're quite interesting, and it's how those judges interpret the law. Okay. So we're going to start out with the most important landmark Supreme Court case that has ever gone through uh, the Supreme Court. And that was the very first one, Mulberry v. Madison. The first landmark case, Mulberry v. Madison, was passed in 1803. The court case is one of the most important cases in the history of the United States. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, they made sure that each branch had checks and balances over the other, ba over, over the other branches. So, I know we haven't really gotten to the makeup of the U.S. government yet. We will get into that shortly. But what you need to understand is that our government is broken up into three branches. The executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Today we're talking about the judiciary. 
when the Constitution was written, <coughs> the executive branch had a lot of power. The legislative branch had a lot of power. But the judiciary branch didn't have that much strength. In fact, many of our founding fathers didn't really know what to do with it. Well, Mulberry v. Madison comes up with what that branch should have. What are the teeth? Where does the power of the Supreme Court come from? How can they decide what's constitutional or not constitutional? Well, Mulberry v. Madison establishes judicial review. All right? It made it clear who the decision maker was when there was a question about the Constitution. So Mulberry v. Madison establishing judicial review allows the Supreme Court to review whether a document or a law or a decision is legal or not legal based on the U.S. Constitution. All right, this allows the Supreme Court to determine whether or not laws when actions or legislation of the executive branch are legal and they follow the Constitution. If the laws go against the Constitution, the Supreme Court can declare it null and void or invalid. So the Supreme Court can knock down a law. They can say this law is not legal, it's null and void, and it immediately goes away. It can't be appealed, it can't be brought back. If the Supreme Court views a law as unconstitutional, it's done. <coughs> it's over. It won't change. Unless the Constitution changes, the Supreme Court has the final say on the legality of a law. So what was the impact of Mulberry v. Madison? Well, it established judicial review. So that was that first box. What was the, what was the impact of Mulberry v. Madison? It established judicial review. Oops, jumped ahead a little bit. And then what is judicial review? Well, judicial review is the process in which the Supreme Court determines whether or not laws or actions are legal or not. So, judicial review is the process in which the Supreme Court determines whether laws are legal or not. All right. This one you're not going to find on your guided notes. This is Dred Scott versus Sanford. In Dred Scott versus Sanford, we see a former slave. Dred Scott. Dred Scott wants to sue for his freedom. He wants to sue for his rights as a citizen of the United States. He wants to be away from um, uh, slavery, and he doesn't want to return to it. So he sues the U.S. government, saying that he's a human being and therefore deserves the rights and privileges of the uh, uh, status of being a citizen of the United States. Well, the Supreme Court at this time looked at this decision and determined that slaves were not citizens, but instead were property. This led to the creation of the 14th Amendment. So Dred Scott is a terrible, terrible case because Dred Scott escaped for his freedom, sued for his freedom, and then was put back into slavery because of this case. All right? It also became a court case that allowed uh, people to chase slaves into the northern free states. <coughs> Um, it's a very dark moment in U.S. history, the Dred Scott case. He made a credible defense of his, his rights and his privileges, and it was stricken down. But what does come out of the Dred Scott case is the 14th Amendment, which came out to say that if you are a born or naturalized in the United States, you are a citizen of the United States. So while Dred Scott had a very terrible ending for Dred Scott and many slaves like him, what happened is because of Dred Scott's case, we see later on after the Civil War that the 14th Amendment is written to protect the rights of those people. To say that no person in the United States is property. That all people in the United States that are born or naturalized here are citizens and deserve those rights. <coughs> all right. Next one. Pleasy vs. Ferguson. In 1896, the Supreme Court reviewed Plessy v. Ferguson in 1890. Louisiana passed a law that required white people and black people to sit in separate train cars. This, of course, is a form of segregation, or separating people based on a characteristic like race. Homer Pleasy, a U.S. citizen who was one-eighth black, purchased a first-class ticket to sit in the whites-only rail car with the intentions of being arrested. Okay, so let's read that again. 
Over pleasingly, a U.S. citizen who was one-eighth black purchased a first-class ticket to sit in a whites-only rail car with the intentions of being arrested. So he's, inten- in, he's intentionally breaking the law. This is a vocab word you had earlier this year. So, if you're intentionally breaking the law in order to show that a law is unfair or unjust, what is that called? I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to write that down. Okay, the correct answer is civil dissidence. Civil dissidence. If you got that right, give yourself a big check on your page. I want to know who got that right later. I want to know. So you guys can message me and let me know if you got that right. I'm really excited to see if you got that right. Okay. He argued that the law violated the 13th and 14th Amendments, specifically the 14th Amendment Clause, about equal protection of the law. The Supreme Court heard the case and decided that separate but equal segregation was not discrimination. So again, another terrible ruling by the Supreme Court, but it will pave the way for the Civil Rights Movement. So one of the statements that Pleasley vs. Ferguson created was separate but equal. That means as long as the accommodations made for another race, specifically here, as long as the accommodations made for the uh, for African Americans and people of color and the white people are equal, then you can force people to be separated. So you can have a white only water fountain and a, bl- and a um, black only water fountain. You can have a white only school and a blacks only school. You have a whites only um, store and an African American only store. And so this became very common and what people would quote was Pleasy versus Ferguson. But what happened over time is that while the white water fountain got repaired and fixed and and uh, and upgraded. The African American one would not be. The city wouldn't put any money into fixing it, or the schools wouldn't be fixed up. They would have old textbooks. They would have uh, unaffected teachers or overcrowded uh, populations. It really was a terrible situation, and so separate but equal um, segregation. Uh, which was determined to be constitutional at the time, really wasn't a great thing. It really ended up to being very, very, very bad because it really enforced a lot of um, a lot of discrimination towards the black community and, and the communities of color at the time. That it led the United States to the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, but Pleasy vs. Ferguson was used to argue that case. All right, moving on. So, what's the impact of Pleasy vs. Ferguson? It created separate but equal segregation as constitutional. So that's the answer we should have got there. But we'll see soon that the Supreme Court gets its act together. In 1954, the Supreme Court reviewed Brown vs. Board of Education. All right? At this time, students went to different schools because of their race. This was another type of segregation. And it was legal according to separate but equal. Many of the all-white schools and the all-black schools were similar throughout the country, but there were still many all-black schools that had much lower quality facilities and teachers. Often black children had to travel far to get to their school, even though there was an all-white school in their neighborhood, right? Linda Brown was a student in Topeka, Kansas, and she had to travel very far to get to her school, uh, even though there was an all-white school in her neighborhood. Her family sued the school district, saying that segregation prevented equal protection under the law. The main question of the case was, does the segregation of children in public schools only on the basis of race deny the minority children (coughs) of equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment? The Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal segregation was not equal in public education. So, Brown vs. Board of Education desegregated the schools, all right? It forced the schools to desegregate. It said that you cannot, in a public institution, you cannot separate people based on race. That they have to be combined. All right? So, this ended segregation in schools. Now, did it really end segregation in schools? Not really. We know that the Civil Rights Movement, uh, or Civil Rights Act of 1968, allowed for less segregation in the schools. What they did is they said, we're going to base schooling off of neighborhoods. So, if there was a neighborhood that had majority African-American 
uh, and they were trying to move out of that neighborhood. We know that before 1968, people could deny other people uh, places to live based on their race or color, right? The realtors just wanted to sell those houses. They want to rent out houses. So African Americans were stuck in their in, in these these run down communities that they couldn't get out of. Um, but we know that after that Civil Rights Act of 1968, they had more access to get out of those. They were able to more successfully integrate into the public schools at the time, and that would lead to a uh, better uh, situation overall. But the Board versus Brown versus Board of Education set the groundwork that said separate but equal segregation is unconstitutional in public education. All right. Gideon versus Wainwright. Gideon versus Wainwright. In 1962, the Supreme Court reviewed Gideon versus Wainwright. Clarence Earl Gideon was arrested and convicted or and accused of stealing beer from a wa- and wine from a pool room in Panama City. All right, so here we go. Florida man, Mr. Gideon, right? Clarence, Clarence Earl Gideon was Mr. Florida man. Uh, Gideon was poor and could not afford a lawyer. He asked for the judge to appoint a lawyer for him, but the judge refused. Gideon was forced to defend himself. He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in jail. He petitioned the Supreme Court and they agreed to hear his case. The question was, did the state's court's failure to appoint a lawyer for Gideon violate his right to a fair trial and due process of law as protected by the Sixth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendments. So, uh, Gideon was a, it was a warning he stole from a bar, uh, he got arrested for it, and the judge said, you have to defend yourself. If you can't afford an attorney, I'm not going to force anybody to defend you. So you're going to have to defend yourself. So, could you imagine going up in a debate against a lawyer, a trained lawyer, uh, in a court of law? You're not going to win by yourself. It's going to be very, very, very difficult to win. Um, and so Gideon lost, but he appealed his decision. He said, well, you know, I don't think this decision is fair. I don't think it's unbiased. So he appealed the decision, right? That's the process of moving it to a higher court. And it went to the Supreme Court, and they agreed with Gideon. They said, you're right. The Sixth Amendment says you have a right to a lawyer, even if you can't afford one. All right? So, what was the impact of Gideon versus Wainwright? Citizens have a right to a lawyer even if they cannot afford one. This is called public defenders. Okay? So, if you go to go to court, right, if you remember listening to your Miranda rights, the officer always says you have the right to remain silent. They also say you have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you. All right, so I know, oops, there we go. I know it. All the guided notes it has us going to Miranda versus Arizona um, next, and I know on the PowerPoint slide, Miranda versus Arizona is before in Regalt. Just ignore that for right now. We're going to start with Miranda versus Arizona, and then we'll go back to Regalt. The reason is they happened in the same year. It just got out of order. All right. In 1966, the Supreme Court reviewed Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, Amesto Miranda was a poor Mexican immigrant living in Arizona. A woman accused Miranda of committing a crime against her. He was arrested and questioned for two hours. When he was arrested, the police did not inform Miranda of his right to remain silent. And he signed a confession after being uh, questioned. He was convicted and sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. He he appealed to the Arizona Supreme Court saying that his, his confession could not be used as evidence. (coughs) <coughs> because he was not informed of his rights, which is a violation of the Fifth Amendment right to not self-incriminate. And the question was, does the police practice of questioning individuals without notifying them a right to a lawyer and their protection against self-incrimination violate the Fifth Amendment? The, fifth, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the Fifth Amendment, a right, uh, upheld the Fifth Amendment right protection from self uh, Fifth Amendment right, protection from self-incrimination, This is where the term Miranda rights comes from. All right. So, what's the impact of Miranda versus Arizona? Well, the impact of Miranda versus Arizona is that citizens have rights even if they didn't know about them. Okay? Citizens have rights even if they didn't know about them. So, what a great thing, right? So, even if you don't know about your rights, you still have them. 
and they're still protected about from law. That's why when people get arrested, you hear that they get their Miranda rights read, 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 read to them. Okay, they get their Miranda rights read to them. So you have a right, even if you didn't know about them. All right, Miranda rights. Now re golf. In 1966, the Supreme Court in Regal, Gerald Galt was a 15-year-old boy who was arrested and taken into custody for making an offensive prank phone call. Can you guys imagine that? You make a prank phone call, you get arrested for it? Yeah. So don't call Mr. Cantaloupe and tell him his refrigerator's running. He'll turn you in, no doubt. Without notifying his parents, he was found guilty and sent to a juvenile detention center. He tried to appeal, but Arizona did not allow an appeal process for juveniles. The question was, were the, pro, uh, were the procedures used to commit arrest unconstitutional under the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment? Okay, so, he's arrested. He isn't given the same rights in his appeal process. He's not allowed to appeal his decision, all right? As a U.S. citizen, you can appeal your decision to a higher court. He wasn't allowed to appeal the decision. So Galt sued under the 14th Amendment. He said, I'm a citizen of the United States. I'm allowed to appeal my decision. The Supreme Court reviewed the case and said, you must follow the 14th Amendment. All right? So the impact of the re Galt case is minors have the same rights as adults in criminal cases. So you guys have the same rights as adults, okay? You have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney, right? All of your due process laws, you have a right to a speed trial, are given to you as a minor, okay? They're given to you as a minor. They can't be taken away because you're under 18. So the 14th Amendment still applies to you. Now we're going to come to some really interesting ones, I think, especially because they concern school. Okay, we start with Tinker vs. Des Moines. In 1974, or sorry, in 1968, the Supreme Court reviewed Tinker vs. Des Moines. John and Mary Beth Tinker attended public school in Des Moines, Iowa. This school did not allow students to wear armbands to protest the Vietnam War. The Tinkers wore them anyway. After refusing to remove the armbands, the Tinkers were suspended until, the, until they agreed to remove them. Their parents sued the school district, stating that the students were just exercising their right to free speech. The question was, does a ban against wearing of armbands in public school as a form of symbolic protest violate the First Amendment's freedom of speech protection? It's a great question. Right? Do you guys, are you allowed to protest at school? Right? Are you allowed to protest at school? The Supreme Court upheld the First Amendment right to engage in symbolic speech in school. However, it cannot disrupt the learning environment. So, Tinker Verge Des Moines says students have the right to free speech and symbolic speech if it doesn't disrupt the learning environment. So you can't disrupt the learning environment if you decide to protest in school. You are allowed to protest. It is protected speech. However, it has to be, it, it cannot disrupt the learning environment. And we're actually going to see here in a minute where there's some more restrictions on that. So think about that first one. We're going to be coming back to something very similar to that here in a few minutes. All right. In 1974. Good. We're doing good on time. Good. Okay. Just checking, just checking there, guys. In 1974, the Supreme Court reviewed United States versus Nixon. President Nixon was found to be involved with a break-in in the De Democratic National Committee headquarters. If you've ever heard of Watergate, this is Watergate. He was trying to gain information that would help him be re-elected as president. The rule of law applies to presidents, but Nixon argued that he had executive privilege or the belief that conversations between the presidents and his aides are private. Nixon had a tape, record, uh, tape recorded to record a recorder to record conversations he had in the Oval Office, but he refused to turn them in. The, co the prosecution believed that he recorded conversations that would show he had discussed doing illegal things like breaking into the DNC headquarters. The question was, 
is the president's right to protect certain information using his executive privilege power <coughs> completely protected from judicial review? Well, the Supreme Court's answer was a limited executive privilege. So, Richard Nixon said executive privilege protects information that I have. Maybe it's about Area 51. Maybe it's about nuclear codes. Maybe it's about uh, breaking into the DNC and getting information to help him win an election. He said executive privilege or the information shared between him and his aides is private. And in some cases it is. However, elected officials must obey the law. So, he can't break the law in doing that. If it's breaking the law, then it's not executive privilege. Okay? If it's breaking the law, it's not executive privilege. And that's what the Supreme Court ruled. Okay, remember what I told you about Tinker Burns Des Moines? Well, now we're coming back to it. So let's talk about the impact of that. In 1987, the Supreme Court reviewed Hazelwood versus Kuhlman. Hazelwood East High School had a journalism class that was in charge of putting out a school newspaper. The teacher sent the paper to the principal to review. The principal did not like two of the articles, and he had them removed before the paper was printed. The students thought that this was a violation of their freedom of speech. The question was, did the principal's deletion of the articles violate the students' rights under the First Amendment? The Supreme Court determined that the First Amendment does not protect all types of speech in school. So, what the Supreme Court said is free speech or press or petition may be limited by a principal or school board if it disrupts the learning environment. So, I, you know, I know I told you guys about Tinker versus Des Moines, right? Here's the limitation. So, we had a right, and now we have a limitation. If you remember back to 2.4, uh, and 3.6, uh, 2.5, 3.6, if you remember back to them, this is exactly it. You have rights, Tinkerverse Des Moines. However, there's also limitations, Hazelwood versus Coolmer. Free speech or press may be limited by a principal or a school board if it disrupts the learning environment. Guys, there's a case going on like this that will happen soon. Okay, there's a case that like this that's happening very soon. Um... A few weeks ago, two football players at a school, I think it was up in Ohio, decided to run out with some flags that they were told they couldn't they couldn't bring out at a football game. They ran out with them anyways, and they were suspended indefinitely for doing it. They are going to sue. We will see the outcome of that one. Um, it will probably go to the Supreme Court uh, if the school doesn't decide to settle. Okay? So we're going to see... If there's another Supreme Court case like Hazelwood or Colmer or Tinkers versus Des Moines, it's going to be a very interesting case. Okay. In 2000, the Supreme Court reviewed Bush versus Gore. George W. Bush and Al Gore were both running for president. The vote was so close in Florida that Al Gore was allowed to pick any counties he would like to have. Uh, like to have to do a recount. According to Florida election law, the recount was done, uh, sorry, would like to have, to, oh, sorry, let me read that again, so guys, I missed that one up. Okay, the vote was so close in Florida that Al Gore was allowed to pick any counties that he would like to have to do a recount, and that's according to Florida election laws. The recount was not done in time, and ultimately Bush was declared the winner. Gore appealed to the courts asking that all votes not counted by a voting machine, be recounted by hand. Bush argued that this would violate the 14th Amendment and the Equal Administration of Voting Laws in Florida. The question was, did the Supreme Court violate Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution by making a new election law? Do manual recounts without consistent standards violate the equal protections and due process clauses of the Constitution? The Supreme Court determined that states cannot violate equal protection clause under the 14th Amendment when undertaking elections or recounts. So, let me kind of break that down for you guys. Back in 2000, and I remember this one very vividly, uh, Florida didn't get their votes in on time and, they, and Al Gore demanded a recount. But he only wanted to recount certain counties and only wanted to recount votes 
that hadn't been counted by a voting machine. So that would eliminate a lot of voters. George W. Bush argued that you can't do that, that under the 14th Amendment, all votes are equal, right? Everybody's vote is equal, especially during an election. So, the Supreme Court found the 14th Amendment to be true. All votes are equal when recounting a state during an election. So you can't eliminate votes that were counted by a machine, or you can't eliminate votes that were counted by hand. All votes count in a re during an election, okay? All votes count when it comes to recounting. <coughs> All right. So, guys, that is my little lecture piece. All right. If you had questions, I hope you wrote them down. Um, what I'm going to have you do to ask me those questions is, let's see, what's the best way to do this? Um, you can message me in Schoology. You can message me in Schoology to get those questions to me. Now, you should have gotten your homework today. It's going to look a lot like this. All right. It's going to look just like this, actually. All right. Make sure you get all this information in. You're going to have time to do that today. All right. You're going to have time to do that today. I don't believe our class ends until 1045, so you got 15 minutes, okay? You got 15 minutes. I'm going to give you guys 10 to work on it, um, and I will communicate with you guys through there. Okay, so if you have any questions, now's the time to ask me through Schoology, um, unless you can log into YouTube, which I don't think you guys can on your school iPads. That's fine. So just reach out to me that way. Okay. So, oh, here we go. Uh, oh, there were questions. Hey, Jaden. Yeah, I'm okay, buddy. Thanks for logging in. Um, what's your question? Okay, you don't have any questions? That's fine. Oh, well, I appreciate it, Jake. Thank you, bud. No, I, I, do, I think it's just a sinus infection. I don't think it's anything serious. Um, I'm hoping to get my results and be back to you guys tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, but maybe Thursday. Uh, test results should be tomorrow. Hey, Gavin. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Gavin. Gavin, look around the room, uh, and uh, if anyone has their hand up, they can ask you a question. You can type it in.
there's no questions, guys. Good luck on that homework. Guys, questions. Thank you, Chloe. Questions, not not comments. Questions, questions, questions. All right, good. Well, you guys get to work. Jade, you can't plead the third. You can't plead that you don't want. Uh, that you don't want quartering, right? Okay, very good. So, Layla, executive privilege is the right of the president to hide information or to uh, deem information to be sensitive or secure. So, let's say there is information about aliens, right? Let's just take something out, you know, out there like aliens. Um, so, executive privilege would state that the president has the right to hide that information or share that information with just his aides, just his closest people. So the Department of Defense or the Department of the Interior, things like that, okay? So he has the right to do that without sharing it to the public. There's certain information the executive branch can know that they don't have to share with us, okay? Things that we don't need to know. Uh, Naomi, Naomi asked, what does constitutional mean? Great question, Amy. So constitutional means it's legal with the Constitution. It goes with the Constitution, or it's legal with the Constitution. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Layla Nance, look around the room. Is anyone missing today? If so, tell either Jaden or Gavin, and they'll type it in to me.
Gavin or Jade, anybody missing? Assuming that nobody is missing, guys, I hope you had a wonderful class day. I hope you've knocked out a section of that homework. Hope you learned something new and had some fun. Um, sorry I'm away from you guys. Hopefully I'll be back very soon and in the classroom with you. Um, can't wait to go over this material with you and see what you guys know tomorrow. So tomorrow I will give you a pretty good, uh, pretty good do now. Uh, it's got some good questions in it. And then we'll do some activities. So that's looking ahead. Okay. All right. So, uh, what you're going to do now is you guys can put away your homework for now. Um, you can play Spider-Man. Um, and what we're going to do is I'm going to have, uh, let's see. We're going to Michaela go to the middle of the circle. And then I will let Layla Nance, you can pick Spider-Man. Okay, you can pick the Spider-Man. Uh, you guys have time for probably two games, and then you need to get back in your seats at level zero and get ready for your next teacher. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. I will still be here if you have any questions, uh, and guys, have the best of it. See ya. All right, guys, if you're still watching my video, go ahead and um, head out or, or end your watching so I know when my next class is in. All right, so if you're still watching the video, go ahead and turn that off. Um, and, uh, and that way I can know when the next class joins us. I'm going to assume by 49 that we're ready to go in the next classroom. All right.
right, guys. Have a wonderful day. See ya. Hope you caught Spider-Man. Awesome. Hey, good morning, everybody. I am so glad to be talking to you today. Um, good morning, good morning, good morning to all of you. Um, I'm so excited to be back with you guys. Uh, even if I am away from school, I'm still here teaching you, and that is an awesome opportunity and I, something I really love and really enjoy. All right, guys, so today we are going to be getting into Mr. Cantalo Monday, but a couple things I need you to do is I know you got these vocab words yesterday, so I want you to go ahead and make sure you have them and review them. Number two, can I get someone in the classroom um, to log on to YouTube using their, uh, their username and password, and you're gonna be my communications expert. I'm gonna be talking through you, uh, and you can send me messages um, as we go along. So make sure your sound is off, but you're gonna be typing in your questions or the class's questions to me and I'll be answering them from there. Okay, so let's go through the vocab words today. Uh, we have juvenile rights. Those are the rights of people under the age of 18. We have executive privilege. Is that the belief that conversations between the president and his aides are confidential? Landmark is an important or unique decision. Event, fact, or discovery. Prosecute is to carry out an illegal action against the accused person or prove his or her guilt. Judicial review is the power of the U.S. courts to examine laws or actions of the legislative and executive branches of the government to determine whether such actions are consistent with the U.S. Constitution. Hey, Jennifer, good morning. You're going to be my communications expert. Um, no, Jennifer, I don't know if I have COVID yet or not. Um, we will find out shortly. Uh, but... As of right now, I do not. So don't worry about that. Right now, I just want you to worry about class. Okay. So, it's Mr. Calo Monday? I know it's Tuesday, but yesterday you guys did Technology Monday, so today we're doing Mr. Cantalo Tuesday. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to jump into... Um, <coughs> Mr. Cantalo Tuesday. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here with you guys even if it's this format, and uh, we'll keep going from here. So our agenda today is you have a do now. Um, well, we just did that by going over the vocab words, so you're good done there. Uh, we're in our welcome agenda and expectations, then we'll jump into my essential questions, standards, and objectives. I'm going to lecture you on the Supreme Court cases, uh, and then you're going to work on your homework, and then hopefully play beat the teacher. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Okay. So buckle in, Sam Nestor, because here we go. Jennifer, at the same time, what I'd like for you to do is look around the room and make sure everybody is there, okay? Why don't you look around the room, make sure everyone's there, and let me know. My expectations today are that we're going to have a great class, we're going to learn something new, we're going to have fun, we're going to follow champs, and we're going to win, beat the teacher. So, I can tell you we're going to have a great class already, because I know we will, we always do. We are going to learn something new today. You're going to be learning about Supreme Court cases, and let me tell you, you will learn, it's going to be pretty cool. And then, uh, we're going to have fun. Guys, of course we're going to have fun. Uh, we always have fun. That's an important part of learning is having fun. If we're having fun doing it, we automatically learn it. All right, and then we're going to follow champs. So let's talk about champs. Guys, communication. We're going to be at level zero today because it's a lecture. Um, if you need help, I want you to raise your hand. Uh, and Jennifer is actually going to uh, come over to you. She'll let you type in your question to me. 
um, and then that way you can send me the question. But we're going to wait to do that to the end of the lecture, okay? So we're going to wait to do that to the end of the lecture. So you have a question and you're not going to remember it, just write it down on a piece of paper and then you can type it in and send it to me. All right, for movement, you're going to stay in your seat. Uh, participation, everyone's going to participate. We're participating individually as a whole group, right? You're, you're working your, on your own to take notes and pay attention. Uh, but we're working as a whole group in that we're all here together. And then we're going to win, beat the teacher today's beat the teacher reward will be to play Spider-Man. Uh, but that's all dependent up to your behavior and following champs. I know we're going to follow champs, right, guys? Because if we can follow our champs, our communication, our help, our activity, our, our uh, movement, our participation, it will, can only lead us to success, right? It can only lead us to success. I know I heard you guys say that, so I'm going to let you say it one more time in class. One, two, three, if we can follow those, thing, those things, one, two, three, it will lead us to one, two, three, success. Yeah, I know that was not the best way to do it. We'll figure that out later. Uh, we're learning today. Okay. So, our standard comes from Social Studies uh, um, Grade 7, Civic Standard 3.12, which says we're going to analyze the significance and outcomes of landmark Supreme Court cases, including but not limited to Mulberry v. Madison, Pleasy v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, Gideon v. Rain, Rain White, Miranda v. Arizona, Regalt, Think, uh, Tinker v. Des Moines, Hazelwood versus Kilmer, United States versus Nixon, and Bush versus Gore. Our central question today is what is the significance of the following landmark Supreme Court cases? Mulberry v. Madison, Pleasy v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, Gideon v. Wainwright, Miranda v. Arizona, uh, Regal, uh, Tinker v. Des Moines, Hazelwood v. Kilmer, and United States v. Nixon, and then finally Bush v. Gore. So, we are going to learn about the impact of the landmark Supreme Court cases. That's our objective today. So, let's go ahead and we're going to jump in. As we jump in, you're going to need two things. Number one, you're going to need something to write with and a piece of paper. And number two, you're going to need your guided notes, which looks something like, let me see if I found it, looks exactly like this. All right, should have been handed out to you. If it hasn't been, you can follow along using Schoology. All right, you can follow along using Schoology that hasn't been handed out to you. But it should look something like this. Okay. We're going to follow along with that as we go through it. All right. Are you ready? Because I know I am. All right. that where I can see it and still see the chat bar. Perfect. Here we go. All right. So starting off, there have been several landmark or important unique U.S. Supreme Court cases that have had a huge impact on American society. All right. So a landmark is something that stands out. Think about a mountain in the middle of a field or think about uh, the ocean, right? Think about something that just stands out to you. Maybe if we think about the city of Jacksonville, Something that stands out is our stadium, right? It stands out. It's huge, okay? Um, it, it, it's massive, right? TIAA field. It's huge. It takes up a lot of space. And because it does that, it's a landmark. Or if we think about landmarks on Beach Boulevard, we may think about the church right in front of our school, right? It's big. It stands out. It's unique. It's a landmark. So a landmark is an important or unique U.S. Supreme Court case. All right? Judicial opinions are judgments by the court that have changed the way the government can operate and they've helped protect our freedoms. So, what I want you to do is go ahead and write down what does landmark mean and what are judicial review or are judicial opinions. So a landmark is an important or unique U.S. Supreme Court case that had an impact on American society and government and judicial opinions are judgments made by the Supreme Court that change the way the government can operate. All right. So, give you a couple seconds to write that down. And moving on. Okay. So, our first court case we're going to talk, oops, not what I wanted to click on. Our 
Force case that we're going to talk about today is Mayberry or Marbury versus Madison. All right. So this was our first Supreme Court case, uh, and it was first landmark Supreme Court case. It was established in 1803, and it may be the most important Supreme Court case of them all because of the significance that it had. At the founding of the United States, our founding fathers uh, had an issue, right? And they made sure in the Constitution that each branch of the government, and I know we haven't talked about the branches too much because we haven't gotten to it yet, but we will shortly, it asks a question about power. How is the power in our government split, okay? How, can the, how is the power in our government split? Well, right now it's split between three different branches. Our executive branch, our judicial branch, and our legislative branch. And that means not one of them is too strong, right? There's checks and balances for each. But in 1803, the Supreme Court was the weakest of the branches of government. It didn't really have any teeth. It couldn't enforce its rules, okay? Couldn't enforce its rulings on the Constitution. And so, in Mulberry versus Madison, the Supreme Court ruled in their defense that they had the power of judicial review, okay? And this gave the Supreme Court its check and balance over the other branches of government, okay? So in Mulberry v. Madison, it established that the Supreme Court had the power of judicial, judicial review. This allowed the Supreme Court to determine whether or not laws and actions of the legislative and executive branches are legal and that they follow the Constitution. If the laws or actions go against the Constitution, the Supreme Court can declare it null and void or invalid. <clears throat> so the Supreme Court has ultimate power there, guys. If it thinks a law goes against the Constitution, or a ruling goes against the Constitution, or an action goes against the Constitution, they can declare it null and void. They can say it doesn't count. It doesn't exist. It goes against the Constitution and therefore is not legal. It's an incredibly powerful uh, thing that they can do. They can literally take laws and strike them down. Okay, They can literally take laws and strike them down. So what was the impact of Mulberry versus Madison? Well, the answer is on the board. It established judicial review. Okay. Our next case isn't on our guided notes, and I, uh, I wanted to talk to you about it because it is isn't. Okay, sorry. What is judicial review? Judicial review is the um, ability of the Supreme Court to decide whether or not something is constitutional. Right? Judicial review is the power of the Supreme Court to decide if something is constitutional. Judicial review is the power of the Supreme Court to decide if something is is constitutional. All right. So, our next case is uh, Dred Scott versus Stanford. And this isn't a very bright and cheery case. This one's actually pretty sad. Um, Dred Scott was a uh, former slave that had escaped and, and, <coughs> and argued for his freedom. Okay, people were trying to, to send him back into slavery. And he said, you know what, I'm going to sue for my freedom. I'm going to fight for my freedom. So Dred Scott uh, goes to the Supreme Court and he says, under, under, uh, under the law, right, of life, liberty, and he said, under the Declaration of Independence and under the Constitution, I have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, and so he sued the U.S. government saying that he has rights and that those rights must be protected because he's a person. Well, the Supreme Court ruled that slaves were not citizen. Okay? They basically said, if you're a slave, you're not a citizen. You are, in fact, property. And this led to the creation of the 14th Amendment. So it's a really sad moment um, in, in history. Because uh, at this point, it, it really set the death nail on the discussion of uh, of a slavery and institution in the, in the United States. And, and at this point, the answer is yes, right? It's defended. It's in the Constitution. It, it's in a Supreme Court case that, that, these, that, that slaves were not people but rather property. Um, and this would come back to get reversed in the 14th Amendment. Uh, we see that it, it gets written out in the 14th Amendment that 
uh, all people, no matter what their condition of servitude was or not, are citizens of the United States as long as they're born here or they're naturalized here. Um, so the 14th Amendment comes from the Dred Scott case, but it's a really terrible case when we look at it. Uh, pretty sad, because Dred Scott had a great defense for why he was free and why he was a free-thinking man and, and had the same rights and privileges as everyone else. And the Supreme Court said he's nothing more than an animal. Um, and it's quite a sad moment in, in U.S. history, but a moment that would lead to the creation of the 14th Amendment and uh, and really a, what a great piece of, of, of legislation the 14th Amendment was. Um, but it really is, a, really is a sad moment. Okay, then we get into Pleasy versus Ferguson. All right, so in Louisiana, uh, in eight, well, in 1896, uh, the Supreme Court reviewed Pleasy versus Ferguson. So, in 1890, Louisiana passed a law that required white people and black people to sit in separate train cars. This was a form of segregation, or separating people based on characteristics like race. Homer Pleasley, a U.S. Uh, citizen who was one-eighth black, purchased a first-class ticket to sit in the whites-only rail car with the intentions of being arrested. Okay, so, let me read that again. What I want you to do is tell me what vocab word that is, okay? We used to have a vocab word for this. Let's we'll see if you can figure this one out. Homer Pleasley, a U.S. citizen who was one-eighth black, purchased a first-class ticket to sit in a whites-only rail, rail car with the intentions of being arrested, okay? So what is it called when you do something with the intention of getting in trouble for it, but in order to show that a law is unfair or unjust? Go ahead and write that down on your piece of paper. Anywhere on the piece of paper is fine. Okay, so that's called civil dissidence. So he's practicing civil dissidence. He argued that the law violated the 13th and 14th Amendment, specifically the 14th Amendment clause, about equal protection of the law. The Supreme Court heard the case and decided that separate but equal segregation was not, dis was not discrimination. So the Supreme Court said separate but equal <coughs> is constitutional. So they said you could segregate people based on race, you can separate people based on race, as long as the accommodations you're making for both groups are equal. So, if you create a water fountain, right, you have to create two water fountains. One for whites and one for people of color, okay? One for white people and one for people of color. If you create a store, there has to be one for white people and one for people of color. If you create a movie theater, there has to be one for white people and one for people of color. That's what separate but equal said. It said as long as there is an accommodation made, then you can have it, right? Then it can be separate but equal. So if there's a train car, in Pleasy versus Ferguson, if there is a train car, right, and it says whites only, there also has to be a train car for people of color, all right? <coughs> so it pretty much said we're going to legalize segregation, all right? It pretty much said we're going to legalize segregation with this. Um, we know now that it's a very evil thing they did because as these things were being made, the water fountains, the stores, the um, schools specifically, the African American or the people of colors, um, water fountain stores, schools, whatever it may have been, weren't kept up at the same standard, right? They fell behind. They weren't taken care of. They weren't um, fixed. They weren't... Uh, they weren't equal, right? They went away from that equal part. They were no, weren't equal at all. And so we see this, this form of discrimination that was definitely enforced on, on people um, by the forcing of this, of this law, right? By forcing of these laws. Okay. Let's please these first arguments. But we're actually going to see some hope here. The uh, Supreme Court makes a really good decision here. So in 1954, the Supreme Court uh, reviewed Brown v. Board of Education. At this time, students were in different, uh, went to different schools because of their race. 
This was another type of segregation. And it was legal according to separate but equal, right? So you look back to Pleasey versus Ferguson, it says as long as you provide accommodations for, Afri uh, for, for black schools, you can have white-only schools. Many of the all-white schools and all-black schools were similar throughout the country. But there were still many all-black schools that had much lower quality facilities and teachers. Often black children had to travel far to get to their schools. Linda Brown was a student in Topeka, Kansas, and had to travel very far to get to her school, even though there was an all-white school in her neighborhood. Her family sued the school district, saying that segregation prevented equal protection under the law. The main question of the case was, does the separation of segregation of children in public schools only on the basis of race deny the minority children of equal protection of laws guaranteed by the Fourth Amendment? The Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal segregation was not equal in public education. So, what was the impact of Brown versus Board of Education? That segregation was not equal in, in public education. So they reviewed... Uh, they reviewed the, the law, Pleasy versus Ferguson, and decided that separate but equal does not apply when it comes to the public sphere. So when it comes to public schools, or when it comes to public facilities, when it comes to public jobs, you can't segregate based on color. You have to be able to provide it. All right? So this removes segregation in schools. It creates desegregation in schools. If you want to see a cool movie about this, you can watch Remember the Titans. Um, it has a great, great, great piece on um, on the desegregation of schools in the United States. It's also one of my favorite movies. So that's something that you can learn and find out. In 1963, the Supreme Court reviewed Gideon versus Wainwright. Clarence Earl Gideon was arrested and accused of stealing beer and wine from a pool room in Panama City, Florida. Here we go, Florida man in the paper already. Gideon was poor and could not afford a lawyer. He was asked the judge to appoint a lawyer for him, but the judge refused. So, he got arrested, he asked for a, a lawyer, but he couldn't afford a lawyer, and the judge refused to appoint him one. Gideon was forced to defend himself. Alright, not a good situation, not one you'd want to be in. You wouldn't want to have to defend yourself versus a trained lawyer, would you? He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in jail. It's a long time for just stealing some beer and wine from a pool room. Alright. He would petition the Supreme Court, and they agreed to hear his case. The question was, did the state's court's failure to appoint a lawyer for Gideon violate his right to a fair trial and due process of laws protected by the Sixth and, uh, Sixth and Fourteenth Amendment? The court upheld the Sixth Amendment right that all defendants must be appointed a lawyer if they cannot afford their own attorney. Okay, um, so... What was the impact of Gideon versus Wainwright? Well, citizens have a right to a lawyer, even if they cannot afford one. Okay? So this is when you hear your Miranda rights, and we'll talk about those here in a second. Even if you can't afford a lawyer, one will be appointed to you. That's part of the Sixth Amendment. You have right to legal counsel. You're, they demand that you have a lawyer. Hey, uh, Alyssa, I'll answer that question here in a minute. Thank you for asking. That's a good question. In 1966, the Supreme Court, oh, let me put this up here for you guys, reviewed Miranda v. Arizona. I know we're going to skip down a row and then we're going to come back up. I know it looks confusing, but just follow along. Uh, in 1966, the Supreme Court reviewed Miranda v. Arizona. Estenio Miranda was a poor Mexican immigrant living in Arizona. A woman accused Miranda of committing a crime against her. He was arrested and questioned for two hours. When he was arrested, the police did not inform Miranda of his right to be silent, and he signed a confession. After being questioned, he was convicted and sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. He appealed to the Arizona Supreme Court, saying that his confession could not be used as evidence because he was not informed of his rights, which is a violation of the Fifth Amendment right to, uh, right to not self-incriminate. The question was, does the police practice of questioning individuals without notifying them of their right to a lawyer and their protection uh, and their protection against self-incrimination violate the Fifth Amendment? The Supreme Court upheld the Fifth Amendment right protection from self-incrimination. This is where the term Miranda rights comes from. So, Miranda wasn't informed of his right to remain silent, and so because he wasn't, he didn't do, he didn't know that. 
He signed away uh, a confession that sentenced him to 20 to 30 years in prison. He appealed that and said, look, I, don't, I can't self-incriminate, right? We have a right to not self-incriminate. What this says is even if you don't know about your rights, you have rights, okay? Even if you don't know about them. And police must read your rights to you at the time of arrest, all right? So if you're arrested, they read your rights, and it sounds something like this. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of the law. You have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Do you understand those rights as I have read them to you? Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty close to that. Uh, quoting that one. Um, so, Miranda versus Arizona. All right. Miranda versus Arizona created Miranda rights. You have the right to remain silent, and you have the right to uh, to an attorney given to us by um, Gideon versus Wayne Wright. Now we go to Regal. It also took place in Arizona. And also in 1966, the Supreme Court revert, uh, reviewed in Regalt. Uh, Gerald Galt was a 15-year-old boy who was arrested and taken into custody for making an offensive prank phone call. So I mean, you were close to 15, right? He made a prank phone call thinking it would be pretty funny. Without notifying his parents, he was found guilty and sent to a juvenile detention center. He tried to appeal, so he got arrested. He got sent to uh, juvie. He tried to appeal the case. He said, this isn't fair. I want to take it to a higher court. Um, but Arizona did not allow an appeal process for juveniles. The question was, were the procedures used to commit arrest? Uh, Galt, uh, constitutional under due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So, Galt's arrested. He tries to say that's not fair. I want a, another court to make the decision. When he did that, they said you can't do that because you are not you're a minor. These rights don't apply to you. All right, the right to appeal doesn't apply to you because you're a minor. The Supreme Court reviewed the case and said citizens have rights even if they uh, sorry and said minors have the same rights as adults in criminal cases. Okay, so minors have the same rights as adults in criminal cases. So you guys have the same rights as adults do, is what the Supreme Court said. So if you got arrested for prank calling Mr. Canelo and saying, hey, Mr. Canelo, your refrigerator's running, and I run outside only to find that my refrigerator is still plugged in in my kitchen, right? Uh, then, you know, you go to jail for it. You know, you have a right to uh, the same rights as adults in criminal cases. Now, Tinkers versus Des Moines, another one reviewing minors. In 1968, the Supreme Court reviewed Tinker versus Des Moines. John and Mary Beth Tinker attended public school in Des Moines, Iowa. Their school did not allow students to wear armbands to protest the Vietnam War. The Tinkers wore them anyway. After refusing to remove the armbands, the Tinkers were suspended until they agreed to remove them. Their parents sued the school district, stating that students were just exercising their rights to free speech. The question was, does a ban against wearing of armbands in public schools as a form of symbolic protest violate the First Amendment freedom of speech protection. The Supreme Court upheld the student's First Amendment's right to engage in symbolic speech in school. So, in Tigger vs. Des Moines, students have the right to free speech and symbolic speech if it does not disrupt the learning environment. Alright? So, Tigger vs. Des Moines, they wanted to wear these armbands that, that protested the, the war. The school said you can't wear those. They wore them anyway. They were suspended, and uh, the parents sued. They said, uh, oh, our kids have their First Amendment rights um, under the Constitution. And the Supreme Court said, yes, they do. As long as it doesn't disrupt the learning environment, they're allowed to protest. So you guys are allowed to protest as long as the principal or the Board of Education deems that it doesn't interfere with the learning environment. And we'll talk about that more with our next one. Um, oh, not the next one, but the one after that. Okay. In 1974, the Supreme Court reviewed United States versus Nixon. President Nixon was found to, uh, found to be involved with a break-in of the Democratic National Committee's headquarters. All right, the DNC, or the Democrats, right? Nixon was a Republican president. He was running for re-election, and he broke into the DNC to get information about how to win his re-election campaign. He's trying to get some dirty information on them to use against them, uh, probably in an ad or in another way to, to beat them at the, at the election. Um, 
and the rule of law applies to presidents, right? Nixon still has to obey the law. He can't break in. Uh, he didn't physically break in. He sent people to break in, but he still has to obey the law. All right. But Nixon argued that he had executive privilege on the belief that conversation between him and his aides are private. So he heard about what they, they found, uh, and it was recorded on a tape recorder that Nixon kept in the office. But he said that any conversation that he had with his aides could be deemed secure, uh, security risk and have executive privilege. Executive privilege is the right of the president to hide information from us, okay? So executive privilege, they may have executive pr privilege on aliens, or there may be executive privilege on nuclear codes, or executive privilege on uh, what SEAL Team 6 is doing, or uh, any number of things he can have executive privilege on, okay? But what is going to happen? So he says he has executive privilege and he doesn't have to turn the recorder over, the conversation over. The prosecution believed he recorded conversations that would show that he had discussed doing illegal things like breaking into the DNC headquarters. The question was, is the president's right to protect certain information using executive privilege power completely protected from judicial review? The Supreme Court limited executive privilege, okay? So the Supreme Court said no. Executive privilege is limited by law. Elected officials still must obey the law. So even if you claim it's executive privilege, if it breaks the law, we can look into it. Uh, Caroline asked the question. I will answer that at the end of class. Let's keep moving. Hazelwood versus Kilmer. Okay, and this may answer your question, Caroline. In 1907, the Supreme Court reviewed Hazelwood versus Kilmer. Hazelwood East High School had a journalism class that was in charge of putting out a school newspaper. The teacher sent the paper to the principal to review it. The principal did not like two of the articles, and he had them removed before the paper was printed. The students thought this was a violation of their freedom of speech. The question was, did the principal's deletion of the articles violate the students' rights under the First Amendment? The Supreme Court determined that the First Amendment does not protect all types of student speech in school. All right. So in Hazelwood versus Colmer, we have another reflection back to Tinker versus Des Moines. Free speech or press, including free, uh, uh, freedom of petition, right, can be limited by a principal or school board if it disrupts the learning environment. So if they determine that your action disrupts the learning environment, they can say, um, they can say uh, it does, it's not protected, right? That speech is not protected. So that you can't say that or you can't do that. So, for instance, if you got up and started yelling in the classroom, that's not protected speech. You'll still get in trouble for that, right? You're disrupting the learning environment and therefore you get kicked out of the room, go to Mr. Ryan's office, we have to call your parents. It's not pretty, right? Um, as long as you don't disru disrupt the learning environment, you have free speech, okay? You have free speech. But if it disrupts the learning environment, the principal can limit it. If you guys remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about limitations and, and your rights and limitations to those rights. Well, this would be an example of that. You have rights, but they can also be limited. Okay, you have rights, but they can be limited. Okay. So what's the impact of Hazelwood versus Kilmer? Free speech or press may be limited by a principal or school board if it disrupts the learning environment. Finally, Bush versus Gore. All right. In 2000, the Supreme Court reviewed Bush first Gore. George W. Bush and Al Gore were both running for president. The vote was so close in Florida that Al Gore was allowed to pick any counties he would like to have to do a recount. According to the Florida election laws, the recount was not done in time, and ultimately Bush was declared the winner. Gore appealed to the courts asking that all votes not counted by a voting machine be recounted by hand. Both argue that this would violate the 14th Amendment and that the equal administration of voting laws in Florida. This question was, did the Supreme Court violate Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the U.S. Constitution by making new election law? Do manual recounts without uh, consistent standards violate the equal protection and due process clause of the Constitution? The Supreme Court determined that states cannot violate equal protection clause under the 14th Amendment when undertaking election results. So what was the impact of Bush versus Gore? So the question here was, um, President Bush and Al Gore were running for office, and it was very close, and it came down to Florida. 
All right, but there was a in Florida, the vote was so close that it came within the margin of error, which means uh, the voting the voting numbers came within two percent. Okay, two percent, and at that point, uh, it initiates a recount. At that point, it initiates the recount. The gu- the um, the the candidates can then pick counties that they want recounted to see if the vote count had been messed up. So when the county was very close, the uh, the candidate can say, "Hey, I want to recount." Let's say Duval County and Clay County and Baker County. I want to see where their votes landed. All right. So they recount all those votes. But Al Gore said, "I only want you to recount the votes done uh, without a voting machine. Okay, without a vote counting machine." Um, and President George W. Bush, at the, the before that time was just George W. Bush, um, argued that that's not equal under the 14th Amendment, right? Your 14th Amendment says you're a citizen, that means your vote counts. So if your vote counts, it can't be taken away uh, during an election, right? Your vote can't be taken away because it was done, it was counted by a voting machine instead of by hand, all right? That was his argument. Uh, George W. Bush would end up getting winning the election. Uh, and the Supreme Court said all votes are equal when you're counting a state during an election. Okay, guys, that is it for the lecture. Now, I have some questions. Um, Caroline says, we can protest, question mark. Does that mean if we sign petition or start a protest about having recess again and we don't have, uh, and we don't disrupt the learning environment, maybe we can have recess again? So, it's a great question, Caroline. Um, but there would be some restrictions there, of course, right? There's only so much time in a day. So do we need to extend the school day in order for you guys to have recess? Because by state law, we're mandated to give you a certain number of hours in the classroom. Okay? You have to take civics. you got to take math. you got to take science. You have to take uh, English for something like two hours a day. Okay? So you have to take all those courses. All right? So we could get rid of your electives, I guess, but you have to, you have, to have PE. So we get rid of your electives, um, but then I, you also have to have elective hours to graduate. So the question comes down to, are you willing to sacrifice more of your time outside of school in order to have recess at school? I think that would be the question, right? But surely you can petition. You just have to know that um, the principal could at any time say, well, I don't think this petition is, is uh, fair or just, and he could cancel it, right? You cancel it. Okay. Other questions. Other questions. Seeing none uh, just yet. I'm sure there is something coming around. Um, what is the homework due? The homework is due tomorrow. It's due tomorrow. And I'll actually gonna have someone count that for you guys. We're gonna make sure we have that in. Okay. So homework is due tomorrow. All right. So what I need you to do, uh, guys, is I need you to go ahead and you can begin working on your homework. You can be work, begin working on your homework, and you can do that now. All right, get to it. Thank you, Jennifer. Oh, yeah, let's say you asked, what would happen if a white person drank out of a person of color water fountain? Well, I'm not sure, Alyssa. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if that'd be enforced or not. Um, it, I don't know. I don't know. That's a great question. I, and I don't, I don't know, and I'd have to ask somebody that, that lived during that time uh, an answer for that because I don't know. Um, I'm sure there's, a, there's an answer to that question. I just don't know what it is. At my old school, this girl started a petition having recess in middle school when she got around 20 names signed, uh, 200 names signed. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, petitions happen all the time. People sign petitions all the time. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they go anywhere, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean they go anywhere. Uh, people petition to have Trump removed from office. But again, it's not necessarily how things work. You can petition all you want, but it doesn't mean it's going to go through. All right. Okay, any questions, guys? More questions.
All right. Well, hey. Get back to work, guys. Get back to work. Juniper, yes, I miss you guys too. I wish I could be there. Um, but you guys got to bring the energy too. You know, you got to bring the energy too. That love of learning brings energy. Yeah, Eddie, I got tested as a precaution just in case. Um, uh, just in case. I think it's just a sinus infection. Um, but. No, that's not the case. If I test positive, not everyone is positive. Um, there'll probably be, you'll be asked to get a test. But um, if I'm positive, that doesn't mean all of you are positive. Well, tell Eddie thank you for me. Well, actually, I can tell Eddie thank you. None of you have the the symptoms. So that's why you're at school today. You don't have the symptoms. So, um, if you don't have the symptoms, then you're probably fine. Again, it's more than likely it's just Mr. Canelo having a sinus infection. But anyway, get back to work, guys. Get back to work. Shouldn't have to say that. You guys already know. You're going to be working hard. Oh, we're talking in the classroom? What level are we supposed to be at, y'all? Just because I'm not there right now doesn't mean I can't give you all uh, lost attention. doesn't mean I can't write you up, right? You're instructed to be at level zero. I don't understand why we're talking. Excuse me. Caroline, Jennifer, you two will now stop. Jennifer, you're going to be the only one that's talking to me all right now. Okay, thank you. Caroline, I don't appreciate people lying to me.
DC vs. Heller on the uh, homework. Let's take a look. Okay, so landmark is a very important or unique case. A landmark is a very important or unique case. Uh, Jennifer. Okay, so a precedent is something that's happened in the past. A precedent is something that's happened in the past. So it's a precedent. So it means if it happened in the past, it's going to happen that way in the future. So if I make a ruling, if I'm a Supreme Court judge and I make a ruling that, um, that um, all trees are green, okay? So if I say all trees are green, we have a Supreme Court case, and that comes out, all trees are green. In the next case that has a tree and let's say it looks red right well we'd go back on the precedent we go back and look to see if there's other cases about trees and we go back and we see ah yes uh in a decision made by mr cantalo uh in 1920 he said all trees were green therefore we're going to follow the precedent and say that this tree although it is red is also green if that makes any sense All right, guys, have a good day. I will see you later. Um, all right. Oh, hey, Hannah. So this is... Uh, yeah, I remember using this, Hannah. Um, good morning, everybody. Did you guys clap for my uh, for my sub? Would you go ahead and do that now? Go ahead and clap for them. Cheer them all. Because they're doing an awesome job, and I really appreciate it. Okay, guys. So, um... You guys ready to get started? Hannah, you're gonna be my uh, you're gonna be my communications expert, okay? So you're gonna to communicate to me using uh, Teams if there's any questions, or if you guys want to go or something, um, and that way we can uh, we can communicate and stay in touch and know what is going on. All right, is everybody ready? Hannah, is there anybody missing today?
No, we're not on Teams, Hannah. We're, we're going to stay on YouTube. Okay. So everybody's here? Fantastic. All right, guys. You ready to get started? All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here we go. So we're going to talk about the vocab. Yesterday, you guys wrote down the vocab words. Um, and so today, we're going to go back over them just to make sure we understand them. Uh, juvenile rights are rights of the people under the age of 18. Executive privilege is the belief that conversations between the presidents and his aides are confidential. A landmark is an important or unique decision, event, fact, or discovery. Prosecutors to carry out a legal action against an accused person to prove his or her guilt. Judicial review is the power of the U.S. courts to examine laws or actions of the legislative and executive branches of the government and determine whether such, such actions are consistent with the U.S. Constitution. So these are the vocab words. You should have copied them down yesterday. If you didn't, that's okay because you can find them on the updates page on Schoology. Um, so I, I give you a couple seconds to go ahead and make sure you have those written down somewhere because you will need them. Okay. Okay, good, 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 good. I got your attendance in. So you guys are all set. I'm all set. We're all set. Good. Welcome to Mr. Canelo Monday. Well, I know it's not Monday, but it's Tuesday, so... Uh, you did all the stuff for Tuesday yesterday, uh, which was Monday, and today is Tuesday. So we're just going to do Mr. Callow Monday in reverse. So we're going to pretend it is Monday. Uh, Hannah, you're not, you're not necessarily watching on your iPad. You're watching on the screen, and then you are going to be typing in. Hannah, just you are going to be typing in uh, questions to me that come from the classroom. So just watch the screen. You can turn your volume off uh, and just watch the screen as I go through it, and you'll just type in questions as we go. If that makes sense. Our agenda. So we just completed our do now. Um, and so now we're on our welcome agenda and expectations. So good morning, guys. I'm excited to be here with you, even though I'm not in the classroom. I'm at home. Um, but I will be back with you guys very soon. So uh, we're just going to go through and do Mr. Candle virtual today, and you guys are going to be there. Uh, good morning, Faith. Uh, our agenda and expectations, uh, we'll go through that here in a second. Uh, and then we'll get into our central questions, standards and objectives. Then we'll get our lecture on the Supreme Court cases. Uh, that should take us roughly 25 to 30 minutes. Then I'll give you guys time to work on your homework and then see if you guys win to be the teacher. So I know I'm not there, but um, if you guys want to be the teacher, I will let you play Spider-Man. My expectations today are that we're going to have a great class. We're going to learn something new. We're going to have fun. We're going to follow champs. We're going to win, beat the teacher. Uh, guys, we're going to have a great class. We always do. That's my mission uh, is every day that when we get done with civics that you, you look back and say, okay, that was a good class. I wasn't bored. I wasn't tired. I wasn't um, – that I was challenged that I learned something new. That's my goal is that we have a great class every time we have a class. I want to learn something new, guys, every single day. If we can learn something new, we're always growing. We're always learning. I hate days when I haven't learned something, um, and I hope you guys feel the same way. It's so important to learn new skills and, and to define those and, and to work those out. And so today we're going to learn something new. We're going to have fun, guys. Learning has to be fun. Learning has to be fun. I learned that a long time ago. If you want to learn something, make it fun. Make it a game. Make it something you're excited about. If you can do that, you will learn the material so much better than if you're uh, upset with it or if you don't want to study it, you don't want to talk about it. You're not going to learn it as well. So we're going to have fun with it. We're going to follow champs today, guys. So for conversation... We're going to be at level zero. If you need help, what's going to happen is I have Faith and Hannah. They're going to be uh, they're going to be my helpers today in the classroom. If a question comes up, they're going to type it in um, in their iPads or on their iPads, and that way that we can communicate uh, if you guys have questions. Okay, so uh, for champs today, I want you guys to make sure that you communicate uh, with with Hannah or Faith if they have a question. Okay, um, and that's for H. For activity today, guys, you're going to be taking notes, paying attention. Uh, for, for movement, you're going to be staying in your seat. For participation, guys, well, you're working individually to participate in this lecture. 
All right, if we can follow champs, it will lead us to one, two, three. Success, very good. I could hear all of you yelling it from all the way here. All right, um, so let's do it. All right. Okay. Um, just have her fast forward it all the way to the end. Uh, just uh, politely a ask to, to have it fast forwarded all the way to the end there, Faith and Hannah. To where it catches back up. If she needs help, uh, Faith, you can do it. Yes, Hannah, you too. Just tell her it's live so that it, it's constantly updating. Let me know when that's done, uh, Faith and Hannah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go. So we're going to win be the teacher. All right. The standard for today is from 3.12. Uh, 3 it's social studies chapters uh, for seventh graders, civics, uh, 3.12. We're going to analyze the significance and outcomes of landmark Supreme Court cases, including, but not limited to, Mulberry v. Madison, Pleasy v. Ferguson, Brown v. Board of Education, Gideon v. Wainwright, Miranda v. Arizona, Regal, Tinker v. Uh, uh, Regal, um, Tinker v. Des Moines, Hazelwood v. Kilmer, United States v. Nixon, and Bush v. Gore. Uh, explain everything again. Okay, here very quickly. Hey, guys, champs, today, our conversation, we're going to be at level zero for help. Uh, what you're going to do if you need to ask a question, you will write that down on a piece of paper. Uh, near the end of class, Faith and Hannah will type in those questions to me, and I will answer those to the best of my ability. Our activity today, guys, is we are participating in um, a lecture. Uh, for movement, you're going to stay in your seat. Uh, for participation, you're taking notes, and you're working individually. And if we can do these things, it will lead us to one, two, three. All right, I heard you yell in success all the way from here. I think I've already said that before. Okay, so let's get moving. All right, this is your question. What is the significance of following landmark Supreme Court cases? And our objective today is we will learn about the impact of landmark Supreme Court cases. Okay, so what you need to do right now, guys, is you need to have out this wonderful a uh, piece of paper from our guided notes. I'm going to have it open here. I have mine open here in Schoology. Hopefully have yours open in front of you in person so that you can see it. Okay. Um, I'm going to be using mine here. So here we go. Follow along. So it's going to go with that piece of paper. It's going to go to the PowerPoint slides. And in fact, sometimes it will give you the answer. Sometimes it won't. Sometimes it will. You just have to pay attention. Make sure you write down those answers and stay on track. Here we go. There have been several landmark or important and unique U.S. Supreme Court cases that have had a huge impact on American society and government. When you think about landmarks, guys, I want you to think about what I mean when I say landmarks in geography. Think about mountains that stand out or oceans or rivers, things that really stand out. They're there. If you were looking in a wide open field and you saw this giant volcano popping out of the ground, you'd say, hey, you know, that's a pretty familiar landmark. You'd say, hey, let's go hang out at the base of the volcano um, or the base of the mountain or let's, hey, let's go meet up with a big landmark in Jacksonville. Well, a great landmark in Jacksonville is something some of you took a picture by, a big dinosaur on Beach Boulevard, right? There's a landmark there in Jacksonville or maybe it's the TIAA uh, Bank Field there in, uh, in downtown, right? We have landmarks and we can find those because they're unique and they stand out. Um, so a landmark case is a case uh, that took place in the Supreme Court that stands out, that has a big impact on American society and government. 
the judicial opinions or the judgment. So a judicial opinion is a judgment made by the Supreme Court or by the court. And they change the way the government can operate. Uh, and they've, had, they've been there to help protect our freedoms. So what does a landmark mean? Well, it's a very important and unique Supreme Court case. And a judicial opinion is a judgment by the court. Okay, So a judicial opinion is a judgment by the court. And a landmark is an extremely um, important case, a huge impact. Okay, Let's get to our first one. So the first case we're going to cover is Mulberry v. Madison, and that took place in 1803. You see, when our founders wrote the Constitution of the, uh, of the nation, right, they had a idea. They decided that power needed to be split. Uh, the power of our government needed to be split between three branches, okay? So I want you to imagine a tree and it has three branches. Each branch is going to have a bunch of leaves on it, right? It's going to have a bunch of leaves. It has some things it does, right? So the branches of our government are the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Today we're going to be talking about the judicial. At the founding of our country, though, the executive and legislative branches had all the power. The judicial had nothing. They really couldn't enforce the laws that they uh, were there to enforce. They had no power over the other branches. <coughs> in theory, they did, but in practice, they didn't, right? You can have something in theory. You can be good at, at, at soccer in theory, but you don't really know until you get on the field with other players, right? You don't really know how good you are until you play somebody. You can be good at football in theory, but you don't know until you throw that first pass against another team. All right? So, uh, in theory, the Supreme Court was strong, but in practice, it really wasn't. So, Mulberry versus Madison fixes that. In Mulberry versus Madison, what we see um, is that Mulberry versus Madison established judicial review. So, the Supreme Court needed some teeth. Um, the power of judicial review means the Supreme Court has the power to determine if a law or action taken by the government goes against the Constitution, all right? So they can review laws, they can review actions that people make, and they can determine if that's constitutional or not. So for instance, um, if I said everyone has to go out and they have to buy um, a certain type of notebook, right? The government could determine if that was legal or not, if that was constitutional or not. Um, if they determine something to be unconstitutional or not legal with the Constitution, they will say it is null and void or invalid. So what's the impact of Mulberry v. Madison? The impact of Mulberry v. Madison is that uh, judicial review is established. And what is judicial review? Well, ju judicial review is the uh, is determination by the Supreme Court if a law or action is constitutional. All right, Dred Scott versus Sanford. So this isn't going to be on your page, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it. So Dred Scott was a former slave that escaped slavery and fled uh, to the north. And when he got there, he decided that he was going to um, protest, or he was going to sue for his freedom. Okay, He's going to sue for his freedom. He's going to say, look, I'm a human being. I have rights, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, both of them the rights of the individual, right? You have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He's saying, I have those rights because I'm a human being. Uh, but the Supreme Court said, actually, uh, you're a slave or you were a slave, and as such, you were not a citizen of the United States, all right? So it really is a very tragic law. Um, because it stripped this man of his rights. Uh, it, it took away everything from him. I mean, he had just escaped slavery only to be told him that you're less than a human being, you're property. Okay? You're property of somebody. You're less than a human being. Uh, it really is a strong moment in U.S. history, this Dred Scott versus Sanford, because it will set the stage for the creation of the 14th Amendment. But it's a very sad moment. Remember I told you before, history can be sad. History can be dark. There's times in history we look back and we say, we really messed up. But that's important for us to be able to look back there and say, yeah, we messed up, so we don't do it again, right? So we don't do it again. So in Stanford versus Dred Scott, um, the ruling was slaves were not citizens but were property. 
This would eventually lead to the creation of the 14th Amendment. They looked back and they said, look, we messed up here. Uh, if you're born or naturalized in the United States, you're a human being, right? You're a citizen of the United States. Uh, you don't have to be a citizen of the United States to be a human being. But what they're saying is, if you're born or naturalized here in the United States, you have the rights given to you by the 14th Amendment. And those rights can't be taken away by anybody. Uh, those are your rights. And that led to the creation of the 14th Amendment. All right, now we're going to get to another one. Pleasy versus Ferguson. In, in 1896, the Supreme Court reviewed Pleasy versus Ferguson in 1890. Louisiana passed a law that required white people and black people to sit in separate train cars. This is a form of segregation, or separating people based on a characteristic like race. Homer Pleasley, a U.S. citizen who was uh, one-eighth black, purchased a first-class ticket to sit in a whites-only rail car with the intention of being arrested. He argued that the law violated the 13th and 14th Amendment, specifically the 14th Amendment clause about equal protection of the laws. The Supreme Court heard the case and decided that separate but equal segregation was not discrimination. So very quickly, there was a sentence in there I want to go back and read again. Homer Pleasley, a U.S. citizen who was one-eighth black, purchased a first-class ticket to sit in the whites-only rail car with the intentions of being arrested. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to write down what you think the what that uh, definition is. What was he doing there? Why did he intentionally get arrested? We have a vocab word for that. I want you to tell me what that is. Write it down. Let's see who can get it right. Give you guys a couple seconds. When you're done, uh, put up your sign, your house sign. We don't put up your house on. Okay. Hannah, what do you guys think the answer is? When you break the law with the intention of being arrested to show that the law is unjust, what is that called? And he said prosecute. You guys want to try that again? Who knows it? Civil dissidents. The correct answer is civil dissidents. Right? He pleased he was practicing a form of civil dissidence. He knew he was going to be arrested, but he did it anyway. So, oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, what was the impact of Pleasy versus Ferguson? Well, it set up something called separate but equal. Separate but equal. Uh, let me kind of define that. So, in separate but equal, what the government, or what the, what the uh, Supreme Court said is that segregation is not discriminate, is a, uh, is constitutional as long as the uh, commodities or whatever is being used is equal, right? You can separate it as long as it's equal. For instance, if there's a white water fountain, there has to be a, a water fountain for people of color. If there's a store for white people, there has to be a store for people of color. If there's a uh, post office for white people, there has to be a post office for people of color. And so on and so forth. Uh, one of the important ones was schools. If there's a school for white people, there must also be a school for people of color. All right. So, separate but equal, from Pleasley and Ferguson, says that this is constitutional. That segregation is constitutional. We look at this and say that's directly discrimination, right? You shouldn't be required to go somewhere or uh, buy certain things. Uh, because of its uh, because of your race, right? Because of your race, you should be able to do that uh, without being um, th th that's unconstitutional, is what we believe now, right? But at that time, it wasn't the case. So, um, please, Bruce Ferguson, another case where they uh, really sad case in the United States, but it's going to get fixed here with Brown versus Board of Education. In 1954, the Supreme Court reviewed Brown versus Board of Education. At this time, students were sent to different schools based on their race. 
There was another type of segregation, and it was legal according to separate but equal. Many of the all-white schools and the all-black schools were similar throughout the country, but there were still many all-black schools that had much lower quality facilities and teachers. Uh, they wanted to have the up-to-date textbooks that have hand-me-downs. They would have, um, you know, they have calculators or anything like that, but they had uh, materials that weren't as good or weren't on par. So they definitely weren't equal. They definitely weren't equal. Um, so the Supreme Court uh, reviews this case. So what happened is. Um, Oftentimes, black children had to travel really far to get to their schools. Linda Brown was a student in Topeka, Kansas, and she had to travel very far to get to her school, even though there was an all-white school in her neighborhood. Her family schooled the school district, saying that segregation prevented equal protection under the law. The main question with this case was, does the segregation of children in public schools uh, only on the basis of race deny minority children of equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal segregation was not equal in, in public uh, education. So Brown versus Board of Education says separate but equal segregation is unconstitutional in education. Okay, Separate but equal is unconstitutional. So this led to the desegregation of schools. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can check out a movie called Remember the Titans, which is all about football and the desegregation of a small town's uh, high school and how we see uh, people of color and white people coming together for a, common, uh, for a cause. All right. Gideon versus Wainwright. Guys, this one actually comes close to home because Gideon is a Florida resident and one of our very first Florida men that we'll ever talk about in class. So in 1963, the Supreme Court reviewed Gideon versus Wainwright. Clarence Earl Gideon was arrested and accused of stealing beer and wine from a pool room in Panama City, Florida. Gideon was poor and could not afford a lawyer. He asked for the judge to appoint a lawyer for him, but the judge refused. He's poor. He gets arrested from stealing from a bar. And the judge refuses to give him a lawyer. So Gideon was forced to defend himself. Well, now, uh, it would be like debating someone who's an expert in law, uh, and that's exactly what it is. So imagine that you had to debate someone who's an expert in law about why you're not guilty of stealing from a bar. You're not going to do well. He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in jail, which is a pretty long sentence. Uh, for what he did. He petitioned the Supreme Court and they agreed to hear his case. The question was, did the state's court's failure to appoint a lawyer for Gideon violate his right to a fair trial and due process of law as, as uh, protected by the Sixth Amendment, the Sixth and Fourteenth Amendments? The court upheld the Sixth Amendment right that all defendants must be appointed a lawyer if they cannot afford their own attorney. So what's the impact of Gideon versus Rainwright? Well, citizens have a right to a lawyer, even if they cannot afford one. So we can thank Mr. Gideon for making sure mm -hmm. that we have attorneys to help us out. Okay. So now we're going to submit. I know it says regalt right now, but uh, is that second word, uh, second bullet point, but we're actually going to skip down to the third, and you'll figure out here in a second that the uh, regalt and uh, Miranda versus Arizona happened at the same time, so I just have it out of order on the PowerPoint. In 1966, the Supreme Court reviewed Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, Ernesto uh, Miranda was a poor Mexican immigrant living in Arizona. A woman accused Miranda of committing a crime against her. He was arrested and questioned for two hours. Uh, when he was arrested, the police did not inform Miranda of his right to be silent. And he signed a confession. After being questioned, he was convicted and sentenced to 20 to 30 years in prison. He appealed to this Arizona Supreme Court, saying that his confession <coughs> could not be used as evidence because he had not been informed of his rights, which is a violation of the Fifth Amendment right to not self-incriminate. The question was, does the police practice of questioning individuals without notifying their right to a uh, lawyer and their protection against self-incrimination violate the Fifth Amendment. The Supreme Court upheld the Fifth Amendment's rights of protection from self-incrimination. This is where the term Miranda rights come from. 
So, if you get arrested, the police must read you your rights because you have rights even if you don't know about them. So, as a citizen, you have rights even if you don't know what they are. You have rights even if you don't know what they are. So, for instance, your Miranda rights say that you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. And that you have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you. All right, so those are your Miranda rights. And you can thank Mr. Miranda for having those read to you. All right. Mm -hmm. Regalt. Regalt. Also in 1966, the Supreme Court reviewed uh, in Regalt. Galt, uh, Gerald Galt was a 15-year-old boy who was arrested and taken into custody for making an offensive prank phone call without notifying his parents. So he made this... Uh, prank phone call and was arrested. They didn't even let his parents know that he got arrested. He was found guilty and sent to juvenile detention center. So he's found guilty. Uh, he got sent to juvie. He tried to appeal, but Arizona did not allow an appeal process. So an appeal process, guys, is if you don't agree with the judgment made, you can appeal the case to a higher court. So he tries to appeal this to a higher court. But... In Arizona at the time, there was no law that said juveniles could appeal cases. They said, in fact, juveniles could not appeal cases to a higher court. Um, Galt's family felt that uh, that was going against the 14th Amendment, right? The right to due process. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that juvenile court must follow the 14th Amendment of the uh so they said he has to follow 14 minutes. So what they said is that minors have the same rights as adults. Sorry, that, that came out all bundled up, guys. Sorry. So Gall gets arrested, um, and he's not allowed to appeal the case because they said you're not 18. You can't appeal the case. You just have to accept the punishment. His family sues. They're able to win the case because the Supreme Court says <clears throat> we have to treat minors as if they were adults, okay? We have to treat minors as if they're adults. So in the case of Miranda versus Arizona, citizen, uh, er, in Regalt, minors have the same rights as adults in criminal cases. All right. Tinker versus Des Moines. This is an important one for you guys. In 1968, the Supreme Court reviewed Tinker versus Des Moines. John and Mary Beth Tinker attended public schools in Des Moines, Iowa. Their school did not allow students to wear armbands to protest the Vietnam War. The Tinkers wore them anyway. After refusing to remove the armbands, the Tinkers were suspended until they agreed to remove them. Their parents sued the school district, saying that students were just exercising their right to free speech. The question was, does a ban against wearing an armband in public school as a form of symbolic protest violate the First Amendment freedom of speech protection? The Supreme Court upheld the students' First Amendment right to engage in symbolic speech in school. What was the impact of Tinker vs. Des Moines? Well, in Tinker vs. Des Moines, students have the right to free speech and symbolic speech. It does not disrupt the learning environment. So you have a right to protest. You have a right to speech. You have a right to uh, religion. You have a right to assembly. All in school. However, it cannot disrupt the learning environment. Okay, It cannot disrupt the learning environment. So you have those rights. However, they disrupt the learning environment. They don't count. And we're actually going to talk about another case very similar to Tinker versus Des Moines here in a few seconds. But first, we have to talk about U.S. versus Richard Nixon. Now, this one's a little bit tricky, so pay attention. So, in 1974, the Supreme Court reviewed United States versus Nixon. President Nixon was found to be involved with a break in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters. So, back in the day, you didn't have to, you couldn't hack into servers. Um, you couldn't hack in and steal people's information online, so you had to do it in person. So, accordingly, some people working for Richard Nixon, or one of Richard Nixon's aides, broke into the Democratic National Headquarters to steal information about the election that was coming up. The rule of law applies to presidents. Nixon knows this. He, he, he's not above the law. No president is. That's the rule of law in the United States. No one's above the law. However... Um, Nixon issues executive privilege, or uh, executive privilege is the power of the president to hide information from us or to keep information for us uh, under terms that that information is secure, okay, or is private, or is confidential. The president can do that. So when you talk about Area 51, executive privilege extends over that, right? Uh, no one can share information about that. It can't be written. It can't be split out because it's under executive privilege. 
It extends to conversations that he has with people. So if he's meeting with his vice president, or if he's meeting with the secretary of state, or maybe he's meeting with um, his department of defense chairman, he could say that's executive privilege. And Nixon kept a uh, tape recorder in his office to record conversations. The prosecution wanted that tape recorder. Nixon said you can't have it because of executive privilege, right? You can hide that information because of executive privilege. Well, the Supreme Court uh, looked at it, <coughs> and they said that, that presidents could not hide information if it's breaking the law. So what they did is they really rolled back the amount of things that could be covered by executive privilege. They said it's limited by law, so if you're going to do it, you must follow the law. Right? You can't hide uh, unlawful deeds in executive privilege. The Supreme Court has the power to review it. So if they ask for information and you say you can't have it because of executive privilege, they can say, well, we didn't think you followed the law, and now we need to see those. Okay. If the president doesn't turn it over at that point, it goes to a, uh, and they can, be, uh, they can be impeached by Congress for not turning that information over. Okay. All right. Hazelwood versus Kilmer. Remember I told you about free speech in schools? Well, it's back already. In 1997, the Supreme Court reviewed Hazelwood versus Kilmer. Hazelwood East High School had a journalism class that was in charge of putting out a newspaper. The teacher sent the paper to the principal to review. The principal did not like two of the articles, and he had them removed before the paper was printed. The students thought this was a violation of their freedom of speech. The question was that the principal's deletion of the articles violate students' rights under the First Amendment. The Supreme Court determined that the First Amendment does not protect all types of student speech in school. So what's the impact of Hazelwood versus Kilmer? Well, it says, free speech or press may be limited by a principal or school board if it disrupts the learning environment. Guys, something like this is going to happen very soon. We're going to see a case like this happening very soon. Um, I doubt it's going to be settled out of court. Uh, two football players for a school wanted to fly flags to honor um, first responders and police officers during 9-11. That's the thin blue, uh, thin blue line flag and the red, uh, thin red line flag. Um, they were going to run those in, at a football game, out at a football game. They asked for permission to do it. The school said no because uh, some people find those flags to be racist um, and for other reasons as well. Okay, They said they already honored it. They don't have to do it. Um, but they had already they were going to make a special commemoration for that. Uh, because of that, both of the boys have been suspended, right? They, they did it anyway. They got suspended. So I, I imagine we're going to see a decision made uh, based off of Hazelwood and Coomer, something uh, similar to this, that if it disrupts the learning environment, if it causes people to be upset, uh, then it's not going to be allowed in school, okay? So we're probably going to see something very similar to that coming up very soon. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a real interesting case. Okay, uh, can a principal do it or a regular person? It has to be a principal or the board of education or the school board. Okay, Hannah? So it's got to be a principal or the school board. All right? As long as this doesn't disrupt the learning environment. So you can say what you want as long as it doesn't disrupt the learning environment. But it depends on who determines what the learning environment is, right? Okay. And our last one. Uh, all vote uh, Bush versus Gore. Bush versus Gore. In 2000, the Supreme Court reviewed Bush versus Gore. George W. Bush and Al Gore were both running for president. The vote was so close, all right, it was so close, came down to Florida. Um, Al Gore was losing the state, so he was allowed to pick any counties that he would like to have to do a recount. What that means is they come back and they recount the votes that were counted, that were cast. According to Florida election law, the recount was not done in time, and ultimately Bush was declared the winner. So in a recount, guys, they recount the votes in a, in a certain number of counties. Let's say they pick Duval County, Clay County, Baker County, um, and uh, Nassau County, right? So they count our votes here, okay? Um, and then they determine who the winner is based on that recount. There's something we call, um, we, we call uh, margin of error, which means there's a certain number. Uh, that we say, okay, maybe we messed up. There's an error in everything. So we could have messed up counting the votes. So counting for that margin of error does who wins the state. 
That's what they're trying to figure out. Who wins the state? Understand that there could be some error there. Well, they recounted, um, but they didn't get it done in time, and so Bush declared the winner. Well, Al Gore demands that they recount again, but this time they can only count the votes. He demands that they can only count the votes um, that were done by, uh, by hand, not the ones done by machine. All right? So what we see is Gore appealed to the courts, asking that all votes not counted by a voting machine be recounted by hand. Bush argued that this would violate the 14th Amendment, an equal administration of voting laws in Florida. The Constitution was, uh, the question was, did the court, Supreme Court violate Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the U.S. Uh, Constitution by making new election law? Do the manual recounts without, uh, without consistent standards violate equal protections and due process clause of the Constitution? The Supreme Court determined that the states could not violate the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment when undertaking election recounts. Hey guys, stop playing around the chance. Thank you, uh, Joe Maris. So what's the impact of Bush versus Gore? It says that all votes are equal when recounting a state during an election. Right? It doesn't matter if it was counted by a machine or counted by a person. It doesn't matter if it was a mail-in vote or an in-person vote. All votes are equal when recounting an election. All votes are equal anyway. Okay. All right, guys. So we just made it through. We just made it through. So what I need you to do now is I need you to go ahead and start on your homework. Okay. You can go ahead and start on your homework. All right. Okay. So go ahead and get started on your homework. Try to knock that out. You have about 10 minutes. Uh, um, get done and then we'll play uh, a little bit of um, Spider-Man if you guys are behaving. It depends. It's up to your sub. Up to your sub. All right, go ahead and get started. If you have questions, you can type them in. Uh, hey, I probably have a uh, sinus infection. Um, nothing more than that, but yes, I, I went and got tested just to make sure. All right, just to get just make sure. So I'm waiting for my test results before I come back into school. Just to make sure all you guys are safe. Trying to take care of y'all. All right, get to work. Ethan, stop playing around in the chat. Faith, get to work. So you don't like science, Ethan. No, a sinus infection. So, Mark, I'm doing fine. I 
we'll go to sleep, but first I gotta teach you guys. And one thing I am teaching you right now is get your homework done. If I'm doing the dishes, no. Maybe you're hearing my fan. That could be it. Um, guys, get to work. Stop, stop messing me. You need to be working, not messaging. Um, yes. Look, Mark's gonna have detention for life. Don't worry about that. Mark will have detention for life. Um, you can give them less attention forever, all right? You already finished it. Thanks, stop doing the homework so quick. Did you do it while I was lecturing? Not paying attention? That's the homework that looks like this. This one. This is the homework. Alright. Better than paying attention. Oh, Mark sent me a message. Uh, I'll think about it, Faith. I'll think about it. 
Maybe I'll give everybody a piece of candy but Mark. Either I told you I can't do it. Can't even do it legally. I can't do it. I beat you so bad, I'd get in trouble. If you guys behaved in class, it's now up to your sub. You can play, um, you can play Spider-Man. Um, let's say, Mark, you'll be in the middle of the circle. And Faith, I'll let you pick who Spider-Man is. All right. You guys have a wonderful day. I will see you uh, hopefully very soon. Uh, and uh, we'll be back at it. All right, guys. Good luck with the finishing that homework. I'll see you soon. Bye.